Assalam alaikum and welcome to Game Changer. I'm Maryam Zia. Pakistan's foreign policy has always been guided by deep-rooted and historic ties with the Muslim world. Pakistan has always supported Muslim causes all over the world and has advocated for unity among the Muslim states. When we look at Muslim world today, we see a number of challenges that are facing the Muslim world that are uh, regional issues as well as economic issues political issues and social issues. In today's program, we will be discussing how to mitigate these challenges. Pakistan has always advocated for pan-Islamism in the international system, and which, uh, which calls for uh, unity among the Muslim states and for projecting their own uh, cause on the international stage. Uh, today, we will be discussing how to mitigate the challenges faced by the Muslim world and what role can Pakistan play through its foreign policy to mitigate these challenges. To discuss this and more, I'm joined in the studios by former Ambassador Noila Chohan. Welcome to the program. And we're joined by former Ambassador Ali Sarvarnakwi. Welcome to the program. And we're joined online by Dr. Hasnain Javed, who is economist and international affairs expert. Welcome to the program. Um, Ambassador uh, Ali Sarvarnakwi Saab, let me start with you. When we talk about Pakistan's relations with the Muslim world, we see that historically Pakistan has always uh, supported Muslim causes all over the world. How do you see this history? What are some of the key milestones uh, that Pakistan has achieved uh, in, uh, through its foreign policy on the international arena? Well, the, this is a very good question and I'll try to give you a quick roundup of how Pakistan has uh, interacted with the Muslim world. And I'll go back to Qaid Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who when he was going to the round table in London about the future constitutional uh, uh, adjustments or uh, steps that would be taken uh, to, uh, in India, uh, and he was representing the Muslim League, he stopped in Cairo and he met the head of the, uh, uh, the, the Grand Mufti of uh, Palestine mm. and he met uh, the chief uh, leaders, uh, Muslim leaders of that time. So it goes back much before even our independence. Mm. And then uh, after independence, Pakistan was hailed by most of the Muslim world as a uh, fellow Muslim uh, brother, uh, con uh, brotherly country, and we played our due uh, uh, role in establishing uh, bilateral diplomatic relations with all the uh, Muslim countries at that time, which were still independent. There were many which were not, hmm. and we supported uh, Algeria, hmm. Morocco, Tunisia, and uh, even as far away as Indonesia, hmm. we provided so the So Pakistan played an important role in decolonization of these countries. Course. And then let me add two more things. Pakistan uh, was instrumental in the creation of the OIC of course. in 1969, hmm. when a meeting of Muslim leaders took place in Rabat. Hmm. And the remarkable thing about that was that it was because of Pakistan a, that it was the meeting was called, and B, Pakistan did not allow India to become a member. Of course. Because India was trying very hard because of its Muslim minority, hmm. which it is persecuting these days, uh, to, to uh, win membership in the OIC, hmm. which we opposed. Hmm. So our president at that time, he sat in the hotel room, and it was very dramatic, and he refused to go to the conference room, to the conference hall. Because he said that if India is there, I will not go. Hmm. And he took such a tough stand that India was not uh, uh, made a member. So we have, and then, uh, Mariam, I must add one more point, And that is that Pakistan traditionally has never taken sides of, uh, of any Muslim country in any uh, disputes between hmm. two Muslim countries. Hmm. Hmm. Like Iran-Iraq war, hmm. we did not take sides. 
लाइक इन द कोर्स पाकिस्तान हैज ऑलवेज एडवोकेटेड फॉर यूनिटी अमंग द मुस्लिम स्टेट्स एंड पाकिस्तान हैज स्टेड न्यूट्रल इन सच कॉन्फ्लिक्ट्स इफ वी टॉक अबाउट सऊदी ईरान कॉन्फ्लिक्ट फॉर दैट मैटर और इन द हिस्ट्री एज वेल सो एम्बेसडर नाले ऑफ कोर्स वी सी अ पॉलिटिकल हिस्ट्री लाइक एम्बेसडर साहब वेरी एलिक्वेंटली टोल्ड अस अबाउट लाइक दिस इज समथिंग दैट स्टार्टेड वे बिफोर क्रिएशन ऑफ पाकिस्तान एज वेल सो हाउ डू यू सी पाकिस्तान इज कॉन्ट्रीब्यूटिंग टू द करंट रीजनल यू नो कॉन्फ्लिक्ट्स especially when we talk about middle east and pakistan how do you see pakistan's role in promoting uh, peace and stability in the region as well as for advocating and supporting uh, the muslim causes uh, well i'll carry forward from where ambassador nakvi stopped that uh, <coughs> then it became part of our constitution of course to But support muslim countries mm. so we were constitutionally also obligated to follow through that then in uh, so we started opening our missions in 1950s then at the time of zulfikar ali bhutto who was at one point our foreign minister and then he also became the head of the state he had the vision of uh, nakvi sahab mentioned you know oic how it was founded that uh, then pakistan hosted in 1974 we hosted the of summit of course of course and uh, we continue to work as far as saudi and iran are concerned they are both our very dear brotherly countries hmm. and we have managed to keep a balance uh, as far as if you recall there was rcd regional uh, cooperation hmm. which was then converted into eco hmm. in which all these newly independent central asian republics hmm. became members so it started with three countries <coughs> and hmm. then it became a mm. uh, 15 Expanded members to, of course uh, so you can see that there is a pattern that pakistan consistently followed and we continue to do so we also continued with our peacekeeping under the un umbrella in africa particularly uh, muslim africa so we have been contributing in all areas not particular in africa i would say we did peace keeping that was more hmm. important hmm. but pakistan's agenda had always been peace keeping in the world hmm. and we have continued with that and even now we are doing so whether it's in bilateral by whether it's regional or it's well. international of course of course uh, but dr hasan when we talk about muslim world today uh, we see a number of challenges uh, that are faced by the muslim countries specifically so how do you see the economic challenges faced by the muslim nations today and uh, how can uh, muslim countries can uh, work together uh, to uh, you know address those challenges see as a uh, honorable ambassador Uh, pointed out very well in uh, uh, till rabat 1969 but uh, before uh, we discuss to the economic side it is very much important to discuss on the initial side when the uh, malik feroz khan noon was asked by the uh, found, uh, founding father uh, muhammad ali jinnah uh, as for the foreign policy to demonstrate in october 1947 to iraq iran lebanon syria turkey Saudi Arabia Egypt to enhance the trade ties so that desire to create the united muslim front with itself at a, uh, to the center was reflected in pakistan earliest activities so this was the first initial part when it was uh, for the trade as well uh, then is the uh, in the pakistan hosted the world a muslim congress in karachi to uh, revive the uh, muhtamam and aram uh, alam to al islami which was found in makkah in 1926 by, by the king abdul aziz in uh, ibn abdul rahman as saud uh, this organization however inactive uh, until uh, pakistan took the initiative by hosting representative of the 19 majority muslim state in 1949 and the same year the first prime minister of pakistan visited uh, cairo baghdad hmm. and tehran to lobbying for the muslim ummah and then is the 1949 they also uh, 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 organized the international islamic conference in karachi and foreign minister of pakistan presented the idea of setting up a, a, a permanent muslim organization mm. as honorable uh, uh, ambassador uh, pointing out so mm. the burning of the al aqsa mosque in jerusalem in 1969 was the major challenging point where we have to unite and we, we where we have to think and then uh, the bhutto sab came into Uh, the scenario but before that this event was brought to, uh, together by the muslim state 
from around the world pakistan was among 25 states that participated in first islamic summit in uh, held in uh, rabat 1969 but bhutto vision of pan islamic world is very much important and you can relate to the trade side as well and i I'll, mm. i'll spoke more about on trade but in 1971 war against india and the break of uh, break up of east pakistan islamabad uh, islamabad was left with no just the trauma but also an increased uh, uh, security mm. threat from india and then the mm. president of pakistan zulfikar ali bhutto was uh, disappointed by uh, pakistan western allies Uh, which had offered no support to pakistan in war and he withdrew uh, uh, pakistan from the commonwealth and south east asia treaty organized ceto and then is the bhutto vision was to double down on the pan islamism through close relation with the muslim countries in the purest of the uh, agenda he visited afghanistan algeria egypt <clears throat> iran libya morocco syria tunisia and turkey in january 1972 mm-hmm. and he was a successful strengthening the relationship with the key muslim state such as libya and saudi arabia and of course pakistan has a political history of uh, these cooperation we have to make right. the trade relationship on the basis of trade relationship because west west uh, western power will not uh, caring us on the trade relationship so we have to create the trade relations which were uh, which the uh, ambassadors uh, 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 i mean talk about the uh, uh, rcd eco and then we have working hard for this but there is some uh, back channel uh, diplomacy uh, this is why we are not successful in rcd or eco hmm hmm and uh, we will be talking uh, more about this that what were the challenges that these organizations have not been active uh, in playing their role and we will also be talking about the role of oic as well but after a about muslim unity muslim unity in the world and how can muslim countries can uh, uh, you know address their challenges uh, together so uh, ambassador nakwi when we talk about these challenges of course we know that organization of islamic countries as is an important platform so how do you see it, this platform has evolved over time and uh, how can it be effective in addressing the challenges faced by the muslim countries today that's a, again a very good question and i think uh, it can be addressed in different ways uh you see uh just to create an organization is not enough you have to coordinate policies mm. and what each government is doing uh, is very relevant and very important mm. so i think in my view and there can be different views uh the, the the reason why the international organizations uh, pertaining to the muslim countries like uh, oic or rcd or eco all these organizations that we have talked about uh did not achieve the desired results uh, as uh, enshrined in their aims and objectives of course of course because of the fact that the governments concerned have not coordinated their policies and uh, have not embarked upon a common path now that's one thing the other is a practical difficulty mm. you know in trade uh, there are uh, there aren't enough uh, areas of commonality i mean in trade we all are developing countries of course so developing countries are all aiming at developing uh, their industry and developing their infrastructure so uh, there is no uh, sort of give and take it's all of, of them are in the headed in the same direction and doing the same trying to do the same thing mm. so common action uh, becomes difficult uh, so that is uh, the other uh, aspect of it uh, but at the end of it i think these organizations uh, should remain there and uh, in due course the countries concerned will make use of them uh, uh, as the uh, conditions 
uh, become more uh, favorable to them. Mm. But Muslim countries, uh, we understand that they have to make their own conditions favorable, right? Yeah. So uh, let's talk about pan-Islamism because Pakistan advocated for this concept in the international arena. How do you view it uh, in the contemporary era? What are the challenges uh, that Muslim countries uh, could be facing or are facing uh, when we look at pan-Islamism -Islam concept? You see, pan-Islamism hmm. is, is it relevant in the contemporary is era? Is a slogan. Hmm. I'm sorry to say, I've hmm. served in two Muslim countries, hmm. uh, in Jordan and in Algeria. Hmm. And I've been to Cairo and I've been to Riyadh and all this uh, during my service career. And pan-Islamism uh, is uh, a good idea as it is, uh, as an idea, but it does not uh, move people to do things. Mm. Uh, it is not a motivating factor. So uh, pan-Islamism uh, uh, is a very good sentiment, but it has not produced much results because, uh, you know, it ha doesn't have enough uh, basis to, en enough substance to it. And therefore, the economic element is important because if the economic uh, conditions of all these countries hmm. uh, warrant a, a common action or cooperation, then that would happen. Now, what is happening is that the there are some very rich countries. I mean, Qatar has more a higher per capita income than the U.S. There are very, very so, uh, Kuwait is very rich. Of course. Uh, so there are some very rich countries. UAE is now becoming you know, that uh, kind of uh, high. Uh, Devel highly developed a, a country. Then there are the very poor ones. The poorest are some African Muslim mm. countries. Mm. And then you have um, like Yemen, mm. which is very poor. So there are these uh, rock bottom uh, mm. poverty states. Of course. And then there are many countries like ours, Pakistan. So, you know, uh, there is uh, no common denominator for all these Muslim countries. Mm. And unless you have that common denominator, there cannot right. be any pan-Islamism. Pan right, of course. But when we talk about these multilateral uh, organizations or relations among the Muslim states, uh, how do you see the role of Arab Alliance in promoting peace and stability in the region and for promoting uh, Muslim unity uh, across the world? Well, these are important alliances, like Ambassador Nakbi said. Uh, their implementation mm. uh, is also affected by political stability or instability in the member countries. Mm. Uh, even now, look at yourself in Pakistan. Mm. Uh, we are facing economic crisis, but we are also facing political crisis. So, in such a condition, it is difficult to encash on your economic potential when you have political issues. And this is not particular to Pakistan. You see other Muslim countries which are undergoing similar turmoil. Mm. So that's why when you form organizations like ECO, ECO focus was basically it's economic cooperation organization. Mm. Uh, but the complementarities of the economies and what you call comparative advantage uh, becomes affected when there is instability in Afghanistan. And Afghanistan is a core country if you look at the Central Asian republics. Of course. And then you look at <coughs> Iran, Pakistan, and Turkey. So until stability comes in Afghanistan, hmm. the transport of goods, the trade relations cannot uh, be matured. So although we talk about pipelines, we talk about gas pipelines, we talk about TAPI, we talk about CASA 1000, we have a lot of proposals. But at the end of the day, until you have political stability in Afghanistan, at least in our region, it will be difficult. When you look at the Arab world, Palestine is, uh, you know, bleeding wound. Of course. Since last 75 mm. years. Mm. Until and unless Palestine and Israel situation is stabilized, mm. 
uh, you cannot have peace in Middle East. In the region, of course. In of the course, region. Of course. Uh, so this, uh, and you must not forget Kashmir also. Of course. And in, when we talk about uh, this yes. region, Kashmir is uh, the bleeding uh, bone. Uh, uh, so Dr. Hasan, when we talk about uh, these issues, of course, economic challenges are also uh, important issues or challenges uh, that are faced by the Muslim countries. So how do you see uh, what are the major challenges that are faced by the Muslim world today? And are there any ways that these financial uh, institutions or rather Islamic financial institutions can work together uh, to promote stability uh, in the region and across the Muslim world? So far I only can say that OIC will work. Uh, when, when it will work, I, I have no uh, I mean standard timeline. But uh, initially when Bhutto, uh, Bhutto's pan-Islamic foreign policy aimed to reduce the economic independence on the United States by gaining financial support from rich Muslim countries. So the uh, Honorable Ambassador uh, answered it so well that because uh, it is about the uh, developing and underdeveloping countries. So all over the Muslim countries were not in the position to handle it so well. So there is a long time happen to uh, when the OIC il will be in power. So if you just mm -hmm. talk about the uh, I mean, economic focus to so Islamic chamber collectively represent the GDP of the seven trillion uh, dollar. So Pakistan should focus and double its effort to increase the trade within the Muslim countries. Uh, to me, it should be uh, into eight times. But uh, so far, we just have to, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, worst hmm. come worst factor, it would be double. So the so countries what are, have a what huge are the key barriers to this economic integration, Dr. Sen? What are the key barriers? The major issues, I mean, uh, some are the tacit and some are the explicit. So uh, the ex uh, tacit, I cannot tell you because there are a long debate and I don't want to be uh, uh, into that debate because it, uh, it should be uh, and it is controversial and I'm not Noam Chomsky to criticize uh, in my own country. But I have to, uh, I mean, uh, apparently there is a major uh, in, uh, difference is in the Western ties and the, of course in the Southeast ties. So when uh, the Saudis uh, take all the uh, instructions from the America and then they have to follow the other sides and then they switch from the Islam, uh, 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 Saudis and Iran. Now the whole pole is, uh, uh, I mean, changing in the different side. So initially it was a, 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 a deadlock or a gridlock between the two countries like Iran and Saudi can no, never be together. But this time around, the second best economy, and to, to me, it's the first best economy, uh, which is China. They make mm -hmm. them together and uh, stand them together uh, on the economic basis. So uh, Ambassador Saab was very right. It is about the economics, economics, and economics. On the basis of ec uh, economic pivot, Iran and Saudi is together, and then now is uh, OPEC plus. So 13 plus countries, and they are now creating another uh, zone where they decide about the oil price so you you know that aramco is in saudi arabia where the four cities uh, their airports their uh, uh, i mean whole supply chain is uh, in their own premises but this is how they uh, the, uh, they uh, they create the power o o over on the islamic countries so uh, america has a petrodollars they don't have any oil hmm. reserves but they have the Saudi Arabia, they have the South Africa, they have the Africa, they have the African countries, there are the Islamic countries, there are right. all of the OIC is under the America. So they make the petrodollar. They just creating and making the dollar out of it, <clears throat> nothing else. They don't have the reserves or, or for the gold or for the uh, oil or for anything. So major reserves on the economic basis is gold. So they of make uh, the Saudis gold on the basis of the petrodollar and they create the overall power on over, uh, rule over the world on the basis of the uh, I mean, dollar. So this is how we work hmm. on. So Pakistan, hmm. how Pakistan can work on it. So Pakistan have to have the relationship with the Saudi but uh, there are of course, so many of course, we will be talking about more about it how Pakistan uh, can work with these uh, issues and how uh, Muslim countries can diversify their economies uh, to mitigate these economic challenges. But after a short.
Welcome back. We were discussing about the economic challenges faced by the Muslim world today. Uh, so, Ambassador Nakvi, when we talk about these challenges, are there some examples of successful economic uh, cooperation or integration among the Muslim states and uh, how can be they be replicated? Well, we have uh, some interaction which have been successful and uh, I think uh, uh, more recently, Saudi Arabia has uh, even expressed readiness to participate in CPEC, for example. Of course, of course. And to set up a refinery hmm. uh, in uh, near Gawadar, hmm. uh, which would be, uh, you know, a very big investment. So uh, there are there are uh, certain instances hmm. in which. In, uh, Hmm. Which can be replicated. Can be replicated. So, uh, do you think uh, there are some impacts of global financial institutions' policies on the Muslim world? Like you earlier mentioned, that most of the Muslim worlds are developing or under developing. So, how how does these policies impact the Muslim countries? Well, they all uh, have like at the moment the uh, international financial institutions are providing assistance uh, or are in the process of approving mm. assistance for uh, three Muslim countries, mm. not just Pakistan. Pakistan, Tunisia and Egypt. They all have uh, severe balance of payments problems, of low uh, reserves, for foreign exchange reserves and uh, a very, very uh, big deficit, mm. uh, both internal and external. Mm. So, uh, the, they all have approached the IMF for assistance. So, there are, you know, uh, problems in the Islamic world, in the Muslim world, because I prefer the word Muslim world rather than Islamic. I mean, Islamic makes it a religious kind of. Uh, right. Muslim is cultural, more cultural. Mm. Because they all happen to follow Islam, but they are Muslims. So, uh, the, the, uh, economic situation of uh, most Muslim countries uh, are, are not all that of course. good. Hmm. The, of course, for those which have big oil uh, earnings, hmm. uh, like, uh, you know, Saudi Arabia, Saudi Iran, or Gulf, even Gulf states for that Gulf matter. States, even course. Iraq now, hmm. Hmm. because Iraq is a big oil producer. Hmm. Hmm. Then there are even uh, Kazakhstan and Azerbaijan, uh, Central Asian states. Hmm. So, uh, they are uh, doing better than uh, the others and the f impact of the financial institutions on them is not very big because they are not dependent upon the international financial institutions. Hmm. They, they don't go to the IMF. Of course. Uh, so, uh, they do have some World Bank hmm. programs uh, for, for hmm. their... Uh, but, but in your opinion that m major uh, financial institutions do impact uh, these, uh, you know, um, yeah. uh, countries, Muslim countries, most of the Muslim countries. So let's talk about the political challenges faced by the Muslim world today. Uh, in your opinion, what are the major political challenges? And how do you see that Pakistan's foreign policy has been successful in addressing uh, these challenges, in promoting peace and harmony among the Muslim world? Uh, Mariam, carrying forward from what uh, Ambassador Nakwi was saying, uh, the Bretton Woods system that was established at the time, mm, 90, after the World War II, uh, is now being seen as a, a, a system that needs reforms. Mm. You know, you asked how it is uh, impacting the Muslim world. It is uh, impacting Muslim world in particular and developing countries in general. Of course. Because uh, the IMF conditionalities have become more intrusive uh, than they were earlier mandated to. So those countries which are donor countries to IMF uh, then play politics for economics. Mm. And IMF has a history that a lot of countries that were dependent on IMF then fell apart of because course. of their conditionality. The governments fell apart. Mm. And now we are talking about the UN reforms, we are talking about the Bretton Woods systems reform we have to come up with alternative system. Mm. Uh, you can see GCC is a good cooperation, but it is within those countries that are in the Gulf. Mm. Um, I, you know, when you ask the question, uh, how can we make it more successful? 
The point is they haven't failed. ECO hasn't failed. Mm -hmm. But it hasn't achieved the target pending stability in some of the member countries. Mm -hmm. So these organizations are platforms. Uh, they can act as catalysts, but the member countries have to bring their houses in order. Mm. And unfortunately, in most of the Muslim world that you see, mm. uh, there are a lot of internal uh, political, social, mm. economic They're conflict ridden, issues. Of course. Mm. Uh, these issues have to be addressed at internal level first. Then you talk about foreign policy, because foreign policy is extension of your domestic policy. So if you are uh, strong in your economics, of if you're strong in your politics, mm. then you have a voice. Mm. But if you don't have that, mm. it's a problem. We talk about Pakistan's voice internationally. Uh, Dr. Stan, we know that Pakistan always have advocated uh, for Kashmir cause and for Palestine uh, conflict as well. So how do you see Pakistan's policy uh, has been received internationally? And do you see that Muslim unity can resolve these conflicts in future? Most of the Muslim world is under the IMF and if I talk about the RCD, the Regional Corporation of the Development or ECO, uh, they, they ended up in 1979, so, uh, some of them is, uh, ended up in 1985, Tito and Cento ended up in, uh, like, uh, in these eras and then we are, if I talk about the uh, uh, Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan, Turkmenistan, Kazakhstan, very first time we were uh, in trade uh, for the 90 billion dollar and we haven't trade just because of so many reasons. So uh, who is going to listen us about uh, the Kashmir? Who is listen about the Myanmar? Who is listen about the Jerusalem? Who is listen about the Israeli uh, onslaught on their uh, uh, on the issues? So uh, where is the Muslim voice is being uh, uh, answered from nowhere? So uh, the answer is economics. Very well said by, uh, I mean, uh, ambassador said, if we are not economically or on the basis of economics, if we are not powerful, why OIC has no money? So if they have the money, so for example, the uh, uh, the, uh, the Qatar, uh, 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 the, uh, the Bahrain, they have the huge investment in America and other countries in the imperialist world. So they have nothing to do with Pakistan or and we have nothing, uh, I mean, they need a skill, a workforce, or the labor force. So we just we we are providing just a a, a working space. It's same as the case in the Saudi Arabia. They are just evacuated our four uh, four hundred fifty thousand people uh, for no reason, just because hmm. they just uh, went to the uh, uh, VAC and, and taxation rate. So we, are, we 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 can't survive there. Is it on the basis of the Islam? No, of course not. So, Ambassador Nakwi, uh, what's your opinion on this? Pakistan supporting uh, Muslim causes across the world? Well, we have been very active in supporting Muslim causes and uh, our role has been historically very, very important. Hmm. I'll tell you that uh, in the case of Palestine, uh, in the early days, Pakistani diplomats would be, in fact, uh, guiding the uh, Arab diplomats hmm to fight for the Palestinian cause and uh, our first foreign minister uh, was the one who initiated the idea of uh, resolutions uh, uh, and then uh, Mr. Agha Shahi, the foreign minister who was there for a long time, uh, he, he actually spearheaded the resolutions mm. 242 mm. and uh, 335 which, uh, uh, which, which established the basis for a Palestinian state and restoration of their rights, including the return of refugees of to the Palestinian areas. So, right of return, the recognition of Jerusalem as uh, uh, in the Muslim uh, area, of, because it is, it is east, uh, in the east, where the Muslim uh, uh, Palestinians are in majority. So, we have, and ever since, we have supported the Palestinian cause even to this day of we course. support it. Hmm. As regards Kashmir, we have always played a very active role and it is our own issue because they are part of our own people. Hmm. And uh, we have, we have uh, uh, gone to all lengths 
to support the Palestinian uh, and the Kashmiri cause. Mm. So I don't need to go into the Kashmiri cause that of much. Course. Because that we of know. course, but Pakistan has played yeah. an active role in supporting uh, both the causes and other uh, uh, such uh, conflicts uh, in uh, through its foreign policy, of yeah. course. So Ambassador Naila, when we talk about these challenges faced by the Muslim world, uh, Islamophobia is an important issue. Uh, what do you think that how can Muslim majority countries can do and what initiatives can be taken to uh, you know uh, address this issue of islamophobia islamophobia after 9/11 <coughs> became a serious issue and you know that uh, pakistan had raised this at the un hmm. and now we uh, have made it an international issue of course uh, it has to be you see through better awareness of each other hmm. uh, muslim world has to interact with the non-Muslim world in a positive way so that they better understand our culture, our mm. civilization and that we are peace loving people. Uh, basically ignorance breeds hatred. If you get to know each other better then you can understand each other better and this FIFA Qatar was a very positive step in making the western world understand that uh, Muslims are normal people who like normal games and normal lifestyles. So it had, although initially the Western uh, countries did create issues by criticizing human rights and this, that and the other, but at the end of the day, FIFA in Qatar was very successful in creating that uh, awareness about Muslim culture, Muslim civilization and Muslim countries should be more proactive vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rest of the world to showcase our positive elements, our civilization, our art, our culture, our history. And that can be done through not just governments, but uh, civil societies also. Mm and uh, other uh, elements of the society. Of course. So what is the long-term vision for Pakistan's relations with uh, Muslim countries? How do you see and what role can Pakistan play to promote a regional peace and stability? Pakistan should continue with its positive approach as uh, was already mentioned that it was our uh, main foreign policy uh, cornerstone of having uh, strong bonds of friendship and brotherlyhood uh, with Muslim world, mm. we continue to do so and we need to now further concretize it through economic and trade and cultural interactions. We should be participating in each other's trade fairs with our cultural participation, be it Muslim countries in the Arab world, be it Muslim countries in Africa or in Central Asia, even in of Europe. Course. Of course. Uh, once we interact more frequently, now in your last program, we had spoken of opening missions of course. in those countries where mm. we didn't have mm. before. Mm. So this creates a stronger linkage between Pakistan and these countries. Of course. Uh, Ambassador Nakwi, your two cents on this, that how can we strengthen uh, relations, uh, bilateral relations with the Muslim countries as well as to promote uh, regional peace and stability and mitigate these challenges that are faced by the Muslim world today? I think we should uh, uh, continue with our efforts. Uh, you see, uh, let me tell you one thing, that the Muslim countries are part of our own culture and our own religion and this and that. Uh, all that hmm. determines the character of a nation, we share with them. Uh, now, they are like family. In a family, there might be some people you don't get along with or of don't course. like, uh, but that's your family. You can't change it. So, the Muslim world are part of our background and our uh, existence. So we have to work with them and we should continue to try and establish the best of um, trade, economic, cultural and other uh, 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 linkages. Uh, of course, Muslim world is facing a number of challenges that we have discussed and highlighted throughout the program. Uh, but quickly, uh, how do you see we can promote uh, unity and cooperation among the Muslim world? Yes, um, I mean, that is a very important question. Yes, of course, we have to 
uh, I mean, deal in a better way like the Turkey and Pakistan are doing uh, the best in the trade. Uh, same as we have to develop the relationship with the re Iran, we have to re uh, relate the relationship and we have to, uh, I mean, negotiate with Afghanistan, not of course with the Taliban, and then so that we can uh, legitimize and take the supply chain from uh, everywhere if the, if the gas pipeline is there, if the other metals would be there. So we have to negotiate in a better way. Then we have to work on the economic basis as, uh, as we were in the Jordan. So uh, after the King Abdullah, we have to deal with another uh, better uh, aspect. So uh, it is in the millions. So we have to make into the billions. So as I told you earlier, that it is just about the $7 trillion. We have to make it double uh, this year around or uh, we have to uh, shift up. The, we have to determine the timeline. If there is no timeline, then we cannot move anywhere else. So the of same course. as the way in the Libya. So Libya, we were, uh, I mean, the uh, America, it was in the under the American influence, but now they have increased the uh, uh, economic ties in other countries. So same as in the Indonesia, Indonesia wanted to work with us. And there are the few agreements, uh, like, for example, it is in the uh, with the Saudi Arabia, it is a friendship tra treaty, air service agreement, uh, uh, then is a S SPA. Uh, expedition agreement, cultural agreement, economic agreement, bilateral political uh, agreements, and there are so many MOUs, but MOUs are just uh, uh, as means uh, MOU, we have to, I mean, uh, uh, hmm. find Practically out the implement those take, MOUs, aways, of course. Uh, take away and output how much in billions or trillions just on the economic pivot. Uh, most of the time, I just not talk about the culture and other thing because this word is all about the uh, economics, economics mm -hmm. and economics. Because if the France and Germany would be the friend, they are the uh, worst enemies of each other. But on the basis of economic, now they are the part of the Eurozone. So same as why we not uh, become the, uh, uh, um, the United uh, uh, on the economic basis. As we have seen that it is just we are not being united as a Muslim state or the Islamic state. We have to be united as an economic state and we have to give something to the Arab world because they have the oil, what we have. So we have to determine what we have, what we can offer to them. And then we have to develop the ECO or uh, uh, RCDA or uh, whatever the coordination and collaboration board could be. Of course. Thank you very much, Dr. Hassan Javed, for joining in today's program. Thank you very much, former Ambassador Ali Sarwar Nakwi, for joining us in today's program. Thank you very much, Ambassador Naila Chohan, for joining in today's program. Uh, we talked about Pakistan's relations with the Muslim world. Of course, we know that Pakistan has always raised its voice for advocating for any conflict uh, that has uh, Muslim issues uh, all, all over the world. Uh, and we know that, uh, of course, a Muslim world are facing a number of challenges, be it political, regional, or economic challenges we discussed throughout the program. But by working together and leveraging their collective resources, uh, Muslim countries can work together for a brighter future. That's all from Game Changer tonight. Take care. Allah Hafiz.